Ever since I started putting up polls for people to vote on the upcoming creatures, my considerations have changed while looking for potential candidates. I generally try to collect a pool of monsters that are sufficiently different from what I have covered before, and having a clear unique idea for the realistic version is also an important factor. I prefer not to have similar creatures back to back. Even with these restrictions for subletters, unique and interesting creatures are abundant and it actually takes me further effort to narrow down the list to 5. It is exciting to create those polls and see the votes trickle in. Every choice is great and I can barely wait to see which one wins. Then there are letters where I struggle to find those 5, where I have to scar through my collection of books to find one that at least somewhat fits, even though I know practically nothing about it. There are times when the last of the options isn't very unique or thought-provoking, times when I throw it in mostly to fill up a space and do not expect it to win. But sometimes they do, <laughs> and sometimes I feel compelled to write a lengthy intro for a video because I struggle to get over the fact that this is a name I'll have to try to pronounce multiple times throughout the episode. Oh. No, it's actually this name, because the one I used for the poll is a semi-common misspelling. Shows you how well prepared I was. But the people have spoken, so here I go dissecting the... It's Quintly Potsotli. Apparently, this is Nahuatl for Hunchback Dog. The name could not be more apt, as this is how it looks. Somewhere between a plastic dog someone had over a fire and a potato. To be fair, this might be on the author of the primary book the Isquintly Potsotli has appeared in. The text description does not make it out to be so... special. According to Francisco Javier Cavijero's La Historia Antiga de Mexico, the hunchback dog has a small head compared to its body, with a thick, very short neck. The ears are positioned low, and a considerable bump protrudes at around the middle of the nose. A large hump runs from its neck to its hindquarters, and the body ends in a short tail that barely reaches down to half of a leg. The base color of its fur is not mentioned, but it is covered in white, fawn, and black spots. Based on this description, one would think of it as more of a capybara-like thing, rather than whatever this is. It is also said to have a soft look, not a desperate gaze of misery. Still, the ugliness of this image is something to keep in mind for later. Clavijero also described the Itzquintli Potsatli to be the size of a Maltese dog, which is small. This is the breeding question, being about 3 to 4 kilograms and measuring 20 odd centimeters in height. So, while you might have initially assumed this is the size of a lamb, it is actually closer to. Oh, I don't know, a paka, maybe? The last bit of info we can gather from the 1780 encyclopedia is that the Itzquintli Potsotli can be most commonly found in the kingdom of Michoacan, or, as it is known today, the state of Michoacan. This region is found along the western coast of Mexico, and once gave home to the Purépecha Empire. One can find a mixture of highlands and lowlands, with plenty of freshwater sources, especially towards the southern half of the area. Now, La Historia Antiga de Mexico is a massive piece covering a high number of topics, only one of which is animals. Therefore, Clavijero did not go into much detail here, only presenting the information we just discussed, with no direct sources mentioned and an apparent lack of any other contemporary books discussing this particular species, the lore of the Izquitli Potsotli is rather lacking. We have no idea about what it eats, its habitat or its ethology. The best we have is some superficial biology and the region where they can be found. That's it. Well, I say that's it, but there is something else we can tackle to the first account. However, I do not believe the two ultimately describe the same animal. Either way, I cannot deny it as a pivotal part of the Itzquintli Potsatli mythos. So, in 1843, a historian by the name of William Hickling Prescott published a book titled Life in Mexico. This two-volume work compiled letters and accounts written by Calderon de la Baraca, a Scottish lady who spent roughly two years in Mexico between 1839 and 1842. 
a highly influential historical work, most of which we are going to completely ignore to focus on a few lines in the second volume. The dates are a bit confusing, but from what I can gather, this entry is from 1840. On November the 15th, Calderon and her company passed by an inn situated in the valley of Guajimaco. I am not aware if this particular valley has ever been identified, but it is not on any current map of the country. The letter says it's within 5 kilometers of the Desierto, which is likely to be the tiny settlement of El Desierto on the southwestern border of the state of Hidalgo. It's close enough to the other places mentioned in the entry to be plausible and not far enough from Michoacan to make its quintly postotly sightings impossible. Either way, Miss Calderon saw some creature hanging on a hook that she identified as the It's Queen Tepotzotli, according to the writings of, and I quote, some old Mexican writers. This old Mexican writer is probably Mr. Clavijero, even though the name is spelled a bit different here. She identified it on account of its hideous look, which is probably the result of the author's less than stellar drawing of the thing. As I've mentioned, I do not believe this to be an accurate identification on account of a couple of things. You already know that I think the artistic representation is at odds with the description. Lavi Hero either never actually saw the animal firsthand or failed to adequately draw it. Probably both, but more on that later. Secondly, the previously mentioned description is at odds with that of Miss Calderon. She writes that this is some species of a dog with a hunched back, a wolf's head and no neck. The hunched back and the lack of a neck match, but I struggle to call this a wolf-like head. Moreover, the nose is supposed to have a bump at the middle, and the Isquintly Potsatli is said to have a soft look. Not things I'd associate with a wolf head, especially since Calderon highlighted it as such, establishing it as distinct from a dog's visage. And if that wasn't enough, there's one more bit of added info. So apparently, this slaughtered its quintly potsotli is not just some random animal. The owners of the inn brought it into the house, presumably to keep it as a pet. However, it proved to be too fierce and had to be put down. Now, Clavijero did not talk about the behavior of the potato dog, but I have already alluded to it being a paca and not an actual canine. I'll get to the reasoning in a minute, but if they are indeed pacas, aggression is unlikely. These rodents are quite timid, and at most their surprisingly loud, warlike sounds could be a reason some heartless innkeepers would put one down. <coughs> I'd sooner believe it to be an actual dog though, which does not make the story any less unfortunate. But enough beating around the bush. Why do I believe this creature to be a misidentified paka, if anything? Well, for one, they fit the description, especially mountain pakas. There's the potato body, vaguely canine build, short neck, bump on the nose, and what Fung could mischaracterize as a hunched back. Their pattern is also a clue, as pakas are spotted with light brown or white on a darker base color. Their size is also right, as is their range. Well, almost. Or more like presumably. Unfortunately, I have no habitat data from the 1780s. However, mountain pakas currently inhabit the Andes, and lowland pakas almost reach Michoacan even today. Since they are rodents, they like nibbling on agricultural plants. Therefore, they are considered a pest, and their numbers were reduced with a growing human population. Both species are in the green due to protected areas, but we can assume that their former range covered a much larger area, including the state in question. Or it could be a now extinct paca species that has not yet been discovered. The former scenario is more likely though. The second clue comes from Claviero's work. More precisely, the context in which the Itzquintli Potzotli is mentioned. Our dubious beast is but one of three canine beings mentioned together. The other two are the Tepe Squintly and the Xoloi Squintly. Xoloi Squintly is a breed of Mexican hairless dogs. They were both friend and food to the natives. Mayan and Totec burial sites tell us that these dogs were sacrificed to serve as psychopomps while the Aztecs consumed their meat. 
So this one is an actual dog and not exactly a white animal, but the other one is more important here. Tepetsquintli is more than likely the original spelling of the more modern Tepesquintle. If you are highly attentive or speak Nahuatl, you might have already guessed that it's quintly means dog, and is likely the reason all three were classified as canines by Clubby Hero. It's in the name, after all. Well, Tepate Squintly, or Tepes Quintle, means mountain dog, and is apparently still used as a name for lowland pacas. Unfortunately, most online Nahuatl dictionaries do not contain either versions of this word, however, Victionary assures me that the version used by Clavijero is a word for pacas in general. So, my theory is that lowland and mountain pacas, being quite distinct, had different names in Nahuatl. The smaller, more potato-like mountain pacas were likely the titular Itzquintli Potzatli. However, this theory is not perfect. Why the name might mean paca, Clavijero describes it as the following. The Tepe Itzquintli that is, a white dog, is a beast so small that it does not exceed the size of a puppy, but so daring that it attacks the deer and perhaps kills them, has long hair, the tail is also long, the body and head black, and the neck and chest white. Yeah, that does not track, but there are a few factors we need to consider. La Historia Antiga de Mexico is an incredibly important piece of historical work but it was not written in Mexico. The author was a Jesuit and as such was expelled from all Spanish-owned regions due to the Bourbon reforms. Clavijero compiled his work in Italy mostly for memory and books from Italian libraries with help from some friends in Mexico. One such source was indubitably Rerum Medicarum Nove Hispaniae Thesaurus by Francisco Hernandez, an even older work published in 1651 but with contents created around the 1570s. If we open up this bad boy, we find a very familiar image on page 466. The name is somewhat different. It's Quinta Porzotle, or Quinis Mexicana, a wholly unscientific name I might add. If we read the description of this Mexican dog, it resembles what Clavijero wrote about as much as the two names match. Chunks of it were clearly lifted, but some tidbits are brand new to our Jesuit author's book. The colouring, size and habitat are most prominent, while the bit that Hernandez wrote about their feet and hanging tits are missing. Now, I must admit that I had trouble fully translating the text as Adobe is not the best at recognizing these letters. I had to manually edit the input for the translator. Therefore, some of the text was a bit difficult to understand, and at one point I had such delightful lines to work with as he showed the fat man his body, and they trampled with the fingers of a divine dog, and with their very strong claws they prostate. And prostate they might, but in reality it says that their legs and feet are crossed with the fingers of a canine, and their claws are very sharp. Interesting. Why would he say that it is crossed with the fingers of a canine, implying that it has canine characteristics? Is it not actually a dog then? Shouldn't the fingers of Canis Mexicana already be those of a dog? I found this book well into writing this script, and it threw me off for a bit. I thought I'd have to scrap much of what I had written and begin anew, but as you can see, this entry is not too different from the more widely known description I began the video with. Even if we concede that this initial entry was indeed just some ugly dog and the wording is misleading, the hanging small breasts could be a reason for that. Even then, Clavijero added too much on his own to dismiss the likelihood of it being a mountain paka. This whole thing seems like historical figures playing Chinese telephone over hundreds of years. First one might be an ugly doggo with a good chance of being something else. Second one is more likely to be a paka, while the last one is again probably a dog. Three different accounts with three different spellings and more than likely two or three different animals. And yet, it is supposed to be part of one coherent mythos. If nothing else, it was worth checking out the It's Quintly Potsatli for this unique mess of the lore. I cannot beyond a shadow of a doubt, declare that I cracked the absolute truth. 
all three might be one ugly dog breed after all, but I find that hard to believe with all the evidence I've laid out. Whatever the case, this pretty much concludes all that is to know about the Itzquin Lipotzotli, or Itzquin Tepotzotli, or Itzquin Tepotzotli. <sighs> The combination of three brief footnotes in historical documents, possibly none of them accurate. Still, we do have enough lore to establish a firm outline, and subsequently we have everything we need to transition to the second act of this video, creating a realistic version that also fits the mythos as closely as possible. So the primary thing we need to adhere to is the description. Hunched back, bumpy nose, short tail, at least vaguely wolf-like head. The drawing is more so a suggestion than anything firm, judging by the other animals scribbled in the same works. Most of them take some liberties with anatomy. Regardless, we also need to calculate in that, while it does not look vicious, it is rather aggressive. However, this does not mean we need to have a carnivore. It is never stated what it eats, only that one had to be put down. It was presumably tame enough to be caught and brought into the innkeeper's home, but it might be easy to agitate. Perhaps it is highly territorial and decided that the inn belongs to it now. Either way, we have relative freedom here and following the extra canonical information we have access to, I do think our best option is a rodent. Well, truth be told, it will even be closely related to pacas, could even be part of the Cuniculidae family, same as the timid little critters, but it is at the very least a representative of Kevimorph rodents. This means they are also somewhat related to other walking potatoes like capybaras and even pacanaras. Very not though, they will be appreciably distinct from existing animals, to a degree a massive nerd like me would appreciate at any rate. So apart from physiological differences, the main problem we need to solve is the aggression. We already coined the idea that this is a territorial behavior. Not constant, as Clubby Hero does not describe it as vicious, unlike the other it's quintly, and the innkeepers must have taken a liking to it initially for a reason. Guarding an area that one believes to belong to them can ignite a primeval, burning rage even in the most innocent of beings. Even lemmings can become hot-headed enough to charge at humans. Something the size of a small dog with vicious incisors would likely be all the more effective at dissuading intruders. This means we have our case for aggression, but we also need a cause for territorial behavior. Not every animal thinks in feudal terms, and even if they do, they might not feel strongly enough about it to go berserk. So, what would make a creature want to protect an area with reckless abandon? Not only that, but this needs to be an aggression directed towards members of other species, not just their rivals. Well, the purpose of their existence is a strong contender as a reason, which would be the perpetuation of life, of course. Yes, yeah, some of you might disagree with the philosophical statement I smuggled in there, but I do believe that the only inherent purpose of life is to make sure life keeps existing. That's a topic for another day though, what I mean by this in the context of this video is that it's Quintly Potsotli would be protecting their young. However, this is not necessarily reason enough. Their offspring can be protected without the use of violence, primarily by hiding or escaping. This would work for numerous species of similar disposition, but our potato dogs are a bit different. You see, like agoutis, they follow a K reproductive strategy, meaning fewer offspring with a heavier investment in terms of parenting. Similar to their distant relatives, they too create nests, but edge even further towards that end of the reproductive strategy spectrum. The younglings require more time to become fully independent, and the adult pair only mates once a year. To offset this, however, they care for their potato puppies far more vigilantly. It's quintly potsatly dig proper burrows, underground nests for the female and the offspring. The male also takes a more active role, not only foraging for his family, but also keeping out intruders that wander too close to their hidden home for his liking. Admittedly, this is not exactly common behavior for rodents, and while territorial aggression is a thing, it is more often males fighting each other rather than, well, anything and everything. The one example I mentioned earlier are lemmings, but 
they are weird in their own right and definitely do not approach your production in the same way as its quaintly potsotly would. Still, we are talking about relatively large rodents here. If they are somewhat fossorial, meaning they dig holes for the nest, then they also need strong legs with large claws. Due to their diet, which would include the usual hard-shelled fruits among others, their incisors would be quite the weapons themselves. Simply put, they are better equipped to fight back than agutis or pakas. They can leverage this advantage to ensure their offspring are better fit to survive once they leave the burrow. This would also come with a longer lifespan, one uncharacteristically extended for rodents. It wouldn't be uncommon for individuals to reach their 30s, even in the wild. A less numerous, but far more tenacious species that switches between periods of territorial aggression and careful foraging. A life cycle dictated by reproduction and rearing. They wouldn't necessarily fit an absent niche in the Mesoamerican landscape, but would more than make up for that with their determination to see the next generations through. Until humans encroach on their habitats, that is. I'd say part of the lore is how rare they are, and that they completely disappear after the 1800s. The Purepecha Empire, its predecessors, as well as its neighbors would have already negatively affected their numbers. Habitat loss, hunting, culling them for their aggression, these are all inevitable. The arrival of the Spanish would have only exacerbated the problem, not even mentioning the increase in human population in the coming decades and centuries. Where the more timid and elusive rodents survived, the more rigid, territorial and often confrontational is quintly Potsotli wouldn't be so lucky. Going by the lore, even Clavijero's account talks about them in the past tense and how they were once numerous in the state of Michoacan. Judging by his drawings, he may not have even seen one canonically, as it is eerily like a copy of Hernandez's picture. They are so rare, even at this point, that no other contemporary book even mentions them, and this does not change going forward. Fast forward to the 1800s, and we have one last witness to our species in decline. One that was put down precisely for its hostility towards the innkeepers. However, this begs the question why it became aggressive once it was taken home. Well, I have already alluded to a periodic shift in behavior. While a highly territorial nature is beneficial when it comes to protecting the younglings, it might become a detriment when there is no one to protect. Its quaintly potsatle would become more skittish and elusive when they have no one to care for but themselves. They would not be as good at avoiding danger as agutis or pakas, but they also had more of a fighting chance against most predators. So, when that innkeeper found a hunchback dog on the plains near El Desierto, the timing was rather unfortunate. The mating season was just about to start, and while the hormones had not yet kicked in, it was only a matter of time for the soft-looking goofball to become an angry rodent of unusual size, from prospective pet to food for patrons. So, we have the etymology constructed, but the appearance still has some question marks. While the picture is not what I want to model it after, there is no denying that the bulky body is a prominent feature. Fortunately, this is a likely outcome of their lifestyle anyway. For a considerable part of their life, they need bulk more than slender swiftness. They benefit from eating as much as they can, preparing for the mating season, and gradually lose some of the extra weight as they make sacrifices for the next generation. So, even if not a constant, looking like a potato would be something they are known for. Which means, the best potato cosplay period would coincide with their calmer demeanor, or soft look, by the words of Clavijero. As for the notorious hump of the creature, we will have to rely on fur. While having a large head could justify a buffalo-like spine structure with a large muscle mass, there's quite a bit of difference in terms of absolute size here. If we want to keep the Isquintly Potsotli Maltese dog-sized, we don't have to worry about the weight of its noggin. So the next best thing is a luscious mane covering the neck. But to be fair, that is not a bad idea to have. If we add a bit of extra loose skin, it provides a level of protection. Since we are talking about relatively small critters, most attacks would come from above and be directed at the neck, so some shielding would be almost essential, even if it only serves as something that can be bitten off without the squintly but subtly dying. Not exactly a hunched back, but the appearance of one. 
The bump in the nose is also something well in line with what we have already laid out. Their bite is as much a weapon as a tool. They need to be able to make a vicious attack to dissuade any foe, and for that, they need large muscles closing their jaws. The suborder they belong to is called Histricomorpha. One of the group's main distinctive characteristics is the morphology of their jaw muscles. You can see on these illustrations how the muscles find purchase in this indent towards the middle of the nose. Meaning that if a relatively small member would want to bite like the big boys, they would need some extra space for muscle. That is where the bump comes into play. This extends the indent, making more room for the larger muscle mass to attach. A sound reason and a readily available solution. Honestly, it is surprising how well this all came together. Depending on your preferences, the It's Quintly Potsotli might be one of the less appealing monsters to be featured in this series. It certainly is not a flashy one with wacky features of the wazoo, but it was a community choice, so I absolved myself of all responsibility. Still, I quite like it. I know I say this after almost every critter I create here, so it might just be my ego talking, but I find its simplicity somewhat refreshing. A smooth creation with neatly interconnected lore and biology. What else can a spec evil enthusiast ask for? If I was clever, I could use this segue to plug a bunch of stuff, but I won't do that. The usual links are in the description, take a look at them or not, it is up to you. I'll be here covering potato dogs and gigantic salamanders all the same. Which reminds me that there is a greater than zero chance that this comes out before the Hanzaki episode. That does kind of mess up the alphabetical order I'm going for, but I'll fix it in the playlist. Very not though, it will come one day. It is one of my favorite beasts to have dissected after all. Yeah, that one too. Rest assured, I hereby swear I will not die before it sees the light of day. Well, that's really just setting myself up for.